Hello innovators and welcome to another episode of the Jens Heidland Show, where I connect the dots of innovation and entrepreneurship with my guests. Today's guest is international executive and investor with many years of experience. He's the CEO of Bohem Eckhart LLC. His consulting firm focused on digital strategy and innovation and chairman of the board of Leo, leading edge only the global innovation marketplace. Lem shared his story about being the chief innovation officer at CSC, the setup, the structure, and how he changed the culture. Furthermore, we talk about Leo and the opportunities of a true global innovation marketplace. Please welcome to the show, Lemuel Lasher. Hello, Lem. Welcome to the show. Great to have you. Thank you very much, Jens. Good to see you. Good. Let's get into it. So, looking forward to learn from you today, uh, which is always one of the exercises I put on myself, learning about my guests and learning about their experience and taking always a little bit um, out for myself as well. But before we go into, of course, big innovation and looking forward to learn from you on that one and building businesses, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you and how did you get to where you are today? Okay. Well, I was born in the United States. And uh, in my late teens, I developed a keen interest in Germany and German literature and German philosophy. So I ended up majoring that in college and ended up ultimately at the University of Bonn studying Germanistic. And um, after I, I finished there, um, I concluded, I came back to the United States and it was clear there was not a big, a big market for German scholars and German <laughs> philosophy here in the United States. So I found uh, a really open business environment in the area of technology. And I joined a small startup in Orlando, Florida that had built the software systems for the airline network in the United States. And I spent about five years there learning all about the technology and the industry. And it was really quite, quite straightforward doing that because I found computers and technology very logical and very easy to understand. So um, I, then, I then was recruited by a very large corporation called Computer Sciences Corporation, headquartered in the United States, and went from a small startup to a very big, large corporation. I spent a couple of years in the offices in Washington, DC, and then they, they discovered I had a certain affinity and connection with Europe. So they sent me over to Europe on a what was initially a two-year assignment to build the networking and communications business in Europe. And that resulted in a 15 year stay in Europe, uh, 12 of which was in Brussels. And then uh, the remainder of that was in the UK. <clears throat> and so I ended up spending quite a bit of time there running both the local business in Belgium, running the European consulting business, running an outsourcing contract that the company had signed with BA Systems. After 15 years, we came back to the United States And I was asked to take on the role of the chief innovation officer for the corporation. And so I moved into that role. I spent nine years as the chief innovation officer. And in between, I picked up some additional assignments. One was running the global consulting business and then going out and working with some of our larger clients um, to win business and to consult. So I spent a lot of time all over the world because the consulting business was operating in the United States, uh, Western Europe, Brazil. Australia and India, and the Office of Innovation was a totally global organization. And then I spent about two years down in Australia working on the BHP Billiton contract that we had won for running that business. I then came back to the United States, and they asked me to go over to France to run the CSE's French division. So I spent uh, six months in Paris, which where I had responsibility for Italy, Spain, Portugal, Belgium, Luxembourg. I came back to CSC and retired. And uh, at that point, I started my own company, my own consulting business. Uh, I have a portfolio approach. Um, I'm the chairman of Leo in London. Uh, I started that with a colleague that I learned to get got to know in, in the UK. I have my own consulting business, both for large corporates and small, medium enterprises. And I'm an angel investor in certain areas. Um, I got into the whole area of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency about nine years ago with my son and we we were the angel investors in a company called bread which ultimately was just purchased by coinbase so we had a very successful takeout of our 
or start up there. And uh, and now I just enjoy consulting, board member position, advisory, that kind of work, all related somehow to technology and all related somehow to innovation. So I hope that's not too long winded. No, no, that's perfect. Yeah. Big career. Congrats to that already. So it's been great. It's been a terrific time. So I mean it's and, and it's 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 a truly global um career as well. Moving and working in so many different countries all over the world gives you a completely different perspective than like we discussed before as well, than living in one country only and maybe having two, three countries to deal with. You have like specifically in the consulting business, I think it's very, very, very valuable for the clients you work with because you don't see it only from a local context. You can see if there are a global business, at least what that means from a global perspective. Yeah, and and it, and it was a deep experience. It wasn't just a couple of weeks over. In exactly. And it, I, I found when I first came back to the United States, I had the following identity crisis, <laughs> is that all of the Americans thought I was European and all of the Europeans thought I was an American. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I understand that. I've been back to Germany. It's it's different when you come back. <laughs> it is. It's a different world. So, talking about the innovation part. So, you have been chief innovation officer. I'm interested. In what brought you into that role? So, what was the kind of the itch that you said, "Hey, I want to take this role"? And how did that happen? Well, it didn't happen that way. I never even imagined that I would do that. Okay. Because I was an operating line executive. Mm -hmm. I knew how to run a consulting business. I knew how to run large uh, outsourcing contracts. I had been, had been running the BA systems contract for many, many years. And But what happened is the uh, CSC's growth started to slow and its margins started to be compressed. Mm -hmm. And so they brought Bain in to come and do a 360 analysis of the company And Bain, one of the findings that Bain had was your customers are demanding that you are more innovative. And if you don't do that, you're not going to get the growth you're looking for and you're not going to get the margin expansion. So they made a recommendation to establish an office of innovation. And they the other recommendation was do not put just someone from corporate in there to do it. Take someone out of the field and have them run that because otherwise they won't have the credibility with the lines of business across across the enterprise. And that's what they did. So the CEO asked me to take on the role. When he asked me, I didn't even know what innovation was. I mean, I had heard about it obviously, but it's like, well, what do you, what does what a chief innovation officer do? And when I, I told my wife my new title that I was the chief innovation officer, she just laughed. She said, it sounds like you're a fireman or something. <laughs> it didn't make any sense. So I was drafted into the role And uh, I was very fortunate because our CEO, it had full board support and mm -hmm. our CEO took it very seriously. And one of the things he did is he made sure that I had my office right down the hall from him as a signal to the company that innovation was not just a, you know, uh, an idea that someone had that might be interesting. It was going to be a core function. So we reorganized the company. We took about 100 to 120 people that were all over the world in different roles brought them into a coherent organizational structure, properly funded it, and gave me some guidance on areas they wanted me to focus on um, to, to really bring about a culture, a cultural change more than anything else around mm -hmm. the company. Because CSC had a background and a history of government contracting, which is a culture of responding to RFPs. And that's not exactly innovation. And so yeah. That was deeply embedded in the DNA of the company, and he wanted to have someone drive an agenda that was much more consultative in nature, much more proactive, much more engaging on a, on a, on a forward-looking basis rather than just responding. So it was a cultural transformation they were looking for, and uh, that was how it started. And it lasted nine years. It was a terrific experience. Yeah, I can imagine. T talking about the culture of change, I know this is one of the hardest topics in organization because it's a long-term thing. Talking to executives, they always want to have, in the best way, they always want to have the short-term results, but cultural change is taking time. How did you do balance this short-term focus and goal success with a long-term culture shift? At that yeah, time? well, we the, the advantage we had was that I had a structure at corporate reporting directly to the CEO where I had funding independent of the operational 
exigencies of the company. That was the first step, and that was critical mm. because I could step back and I was I was not there to run day-to-day -day P and Ls and to hit numbers and meet quarterly objectives. I was there really to do something that was strategic in nature. That having been said, it was very clear to me that um, in order for me to be successful, I had to survive. And if you cannot survive in a corporate environment like that, if you are not linked to the executives who are running the P&Ls yeah. in some way, if you just get up into blue sky activity and thinking about all sorts of great ideas and things like that, but are not delivering real value to the executives who are running the P&L, they in fact will kill you. It's just a matter of time because you are a cost that's being allocated to the P&L and you have to be mindful that you have to be adding value every single day while you're putting the company in a position to add significant value later on. So, uh, and if, if there's any mistake I made over the nine years I ran it, I was probably too conservative because CSC was a very conservative company. And, you know, you, you have never survived just coming up with great ideas and, and not adding value. So we, we, we created a program and a team and we identified the key stakeholders in the team what objectives they might have, how they might define innovation. And we built objectives and KPIs around each of those various areas. And we measured that and we communicated it on a regular basis. So a lot of it has to do with being really clear on the respective level of um, expectation that people have, knowing what their objectives are and how you can contribute to their success. And in so doing, you get the political support you need in the organization to make the program sustainable. And that's yeah. often why these innovation programs die is because the, the exigencies of day-to-day -day operation trump long-term strategic objectives. And if you don't have a connection, you're not managing that, you, you, will, be, you will be killed, that's for sure. Yeah. Fully see that as well. <laughs> What's that? I, I fully see that or have seen it as well. In some companies, you're brought in as an external, hey, can you solve this? So that's, hey, guy, this is, this is unsolvable. In the short term, because there, there's, there's a lot to be to be undone to make this happen. Yeah, especially if if you have had someone who is not aligned at all, and it's kind of, I've seen it there. Like some innovators are just, hey, we are just there for innovation, which is like creating moonshots, and then we put a barrier to the normal business, and that's that might be fine in some certain organizations and in, in in different direction but if you if you have a business that needs the support and you don't give it it's not going to work long term yeah i like think that's said. true and and one of the one of the things that i learned over the years was uh, a dirty little secret in the innovation business which is no one really cares about innovation really cares about it exactly you know, they all talk about it but no one really cares what they care about is that their problems are being solved and what is important is you understand what particular problems they have and then figure out how you can solve them creatively. And then you start to, to turn on the innovation agenda on that basis. So, for example, if you're not helping the people in the field win new business, you're of no value to them. If yeah. you're not helping the people in the field repositioning themselves with the client as a thought leader in particular areas, you're of no value to them. If you're not helping the people in finance figuring out how to save money for the company, you're of no value to them. So you need to make sure you're doing things that deliver real results by whatever criteria is important to your stakeholders on a continuing basis as you move the long-term trajectory in terms of that cultural transformation. Yeah. And then just to add to that as, as well, being able to translate your moonshot thinking or the ideas that are a little crazy maybe for them from a, from a normal business perspective so that they understand how you can bring value to them long-term as well. Yeah, it's a portfolio approach and yeah. you don't want to have too many moonshots um, in there. You want, to, you want to have some, but you don't want to have too many. And I, I'm, I'm, I find it interesting you brought up the moonshot example. I'll give you one of the opportunities that was put on my desk of mm -hmm. something they wanted me to fund, which is one of our consultants who was based in Australia came and said, hey, I've got a great idea. Let's get together. Let's get NASA together with BHP Billiton so we can go to the moon and do mining on the moon. And that was a, that was a serious proposal that he had made for what he thought was innovation. And I said, yeah, it is very, it's an innovative idea, that's for sure. But I don't have the resources to 
to pull that together. And he and I said that you got political issues with Washington. You're going to need to deal with. Then you got to get BHP Billiton, which is a huge company. Then you got to get you know, putting all that pieces together. I said I don't have time for that. Yeah. And so those are the kind of ideas you have to say. Look, it's a nice idea, but it just isn't going to work here. And you have to have a certain practical aspect of it. But that was one real opportunity that was put on my table. Yeah. Moving from you being the chief innovation officer to you supporting organizations, what did you change in the approach and what do you take from the time that you have done it yourself and, and supporting organizations now? You, you're talking about working with small, smaller yeah. companies. Well, you know, innovation is a difficult thing to do. And, but it's difficult in different ways between a large corporation and a small company. In a large company, the reason it's difficult is because it's hard to allocate resources against a strategic objective like cultural transformation in the face of quarterly pressure for earnings. And it's hard politically because you've got, you know, well-established organizational structures with very powerful executives who have an incentive to focus on the current running of the business. And um, but it's hard to get people. It's hard to get money. It's hard to get resources focused on innovation. That's the big that's the big company problem. The small company problem isn't getting focused on um, big opportunities. The problem is they don't have any resources to allocate. <laughs> so they, they might have a great idea, but they, you know, the venture capital markets do give them a certain amount of flexibility, but they don't have the people, they don't have the intellectual property, they don't have all the resources you need to apply to a particular problem. So the challenge in the small company is very different from the challenge in the big company, even though they're both focused on innovation. So when I'm working with with um, smaller companies, you need to adapt your your focus and your strategy of how to grow a business with very limited resources. And the business that we're running with Leo, we run it very tight ship. I mean, we're mm -hmm. not out there just building the business and getting eyeballs on the website and raising a lot of capital and then losing money. We are running that business as every dollar as if every dollar was my dollars. Right. Yeah. Every penny, every penny needs to be watched <clears throat> because if you get too far out there, the one thing that will kill the business is you run out of cash. And I don't want to be holding just to shareholders. I like the idea of being really close to the market, experimenting with ideas, figuring out what works, because for the most part in the small company, this is all about discovery. It's all yeah. about trying to figure out what is the problem I'm trying to solve and do I have an effective solution in bigger companies? The problem is all about scaling. They, they already know what the problem is. They can see it. But the question is, can they scale it? And if you can't scale in the big company, you don't get the resources you need to, to do anything. In a smaller company, they just like to get traction. And then once you've got traction, you know you have a solution that's viable and you can go to market, then getting other resources is pretty straightforward. So different challenges, but in different approaches for big and small, but they're all focused on innovation, which is very, very difficult to do. Yeah. You, you mentioned in the in the big corporate there, that was your CEO was supporting and was very clear that it is important. How do you secure this with companies like you support where it's not clear yet? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. So I get called in a lot to companies and they say, we want to start up an innovation program. And I say, all right, you're going to need to do four things to get make this program successful. First of all, who's going to lead it? <laughs> who's going to put their who's going to put their career on the line to commit to this in a serious way? And, and don't tell me that it's some individual in the corner office who's in, responsible for innovation. I mean, you better have a serious executive in the company responsible for it. And the criteria I would use is, is that person credibly a successor to the CEO? Because ultimately, mm -hmm. innovation is the CEO's agenda. It's not the chief innovation officer. The chief innovation officer there is to run the governance, the structure, the process, the allocation, the analytics, and so on and so forth. But without the CEO support, it, it doesn't work. So the first thing I ask is, who is running this thing? What is the vision? How do you define innovation? What are your objectives? What are your expectations? How are you going to measure whether you're successful? What sort of incentives are you going to change in the business 
to reward and recognize people that are committing to that agenda as opposed to the people that are running the current day-to-day business. Hmm. And that's the first acid test. Because if they don't have that, I, I say, you're not serious. You're just not serious. And, and you're wasting my time and you're wasting your time thinking that you're going to do something about innovation. It's got to be serious. Whether you have a highly centralized innovative office like I did or a highly decentralized, if you don't have real leadership there to drive the change, you're not going to get the traction. The next thing is I'd say, what changes are you prepared to make in the organization in the areas of structure, governance, and processes? Because if you're not going to make any changes, then you're not serious either. You know, Mm -hmm. innovation is all about changing and adapting the organization in some way. And if you're not prepared to step up and make some changes, which are politically difficult, and they're difficult because of inertia, you're not serious. And then finally, you know, what tools and technologies are you going to bring to bear to enable the people that are doing the work to be able to do it? So that's the kind of framework that I use in working with clients on innovative programs. And that seems to resonate and seems to work pretty well. Yeah. I guess then that, that also means that worst case, if they're not really committed in doing it, then you're you're not the right person to work with. No, that's exactly right. And I tell yeah. them that. You know, there's no there's no point in you doing this because you're just wasting your money. You're wasting my time. And I got plenty of things to do. So it's not like there's a shortage of opportunities now. But you have to be honest. And, you know, innovation comes in cycles, right? Which sometimes it's like ever we got to do innovation. And other times it's quite cynical. And what a lot of people forget is that up until recently, innovation had a very negative connotation. Yeah. In- innovation was not always positive. And. You know, it was Schumpeter who basically I identified why that's the case, which is that in- innovation is fundamentally a very creative and destructive process. And that if you're going to be dis- if you're going to be creating things, you are by definition going to have to be destroying certain things. And the destruction is manifest, whereas the creation is not always manifest. So you end up with a lot of resistance in the system on that basis. And so that's why it's so hard is because you're changing. And we as human beings hate change. Yeah. The only, the only change we like is when someone else changes to our idea of what needs to be done, right? The, 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 the people that are the most um, resistant to change are the ones who talk about change the most fervently. You know, the, the, the most dedicated uh, revolutionary hates the fact that he has to change. I mean, how, how introspective was Vladimir Lenin. Not at all, right? It was all about everyone else changing their entire system to accommodate his ideas of what needed to be there. And so when when you talk about change, you need to be careful to recognize that people don't want to change because change is uncomfortable. And they'll either change because they have no choice or they'll change because they see the change will be beneficial to them. And if they don't have a choice, or it's beneficial to them, they will change. Otherwise, they won't change. And there's a million different techniques they use to convince you that they are changing, but they really won't change unless one of those two things takes place. Yeah, I I have seen it several times. Right. <laughs> Go, going one question deeper, um, when you have been building the innovation team around you that you mentioned, yeah, did you recruit them from internal or external? I would say ninety percent were internal. Internal, because there were there were a lot of creative people in the organization doing very interesting and very innovative things. The problem is we didn't have leadership to bring it all together in a coherent structure and with co- with processes. And the process question is really interesting. That people say, "What's your innovative process? What's your innovation process?" And my response was be, "Innovation is not a process. Hmm. A process can either hinder innovation or it can enable innovation. And the job of the chief innovation officer." is decide which processes are helping and which ones are hindering and either get rid of them or change them to be able to do that. And so process change, process elimination, or or process augmentation are part of the job on that basis. So um, I found that by having people inside the organization empowered with money, resources, compensation, that it was aligned to what they did, I didn't need to get a lot of external. There were some people we brought in on a special occasion, but I'd, I'd say not, well over 90% were, were internal candidates. Yeah, like that very much. I did the same. Yeah. <laughs> when, when, 
and and it's quite interesting because a lot of companies do the opposite. They try to take the best talent they can find who have kind of innovation written on their CV and drag them in to kind of change the business. But then to your point earlier, the business is resisting even more because they say, hey, this this person comes from a, maybe a famous company, but they have no clue about what our business is about. Yeah, and that's a great, great um, example. So um, the reason it works is because you cannot innovate if you haven't mastered the basics of what your business is. Hmm. I mean, just take a look at Picasso as an artist. Picasso, um, everyone views him as, not Picasso, but uh, Dolly. Everyone views Dolly as a, you know, kind of a genius, surrealistic artist. But take a look at his earlier work. He was a master painter. I mean, he was technically superb at the classical painting form. And only later did he develop that surrealism that he's famous for. It's the same way with innovation. Unless you really understand the business that you're in, you cannot actually transform it because you don't know enough about the basics of it. And that's one of the benefits I had coming into the role, which is that I knew the consult consulting business cold. I've been yeah. doing it for 20 years. I've been delivering with clients. I knew what that was. I also knew the outsourcing business, which was part of CSC's core business. So I could understand what needed to be done from an experience point of view, and then I could recognize the change and the creativity that was applicable. So it's much easier to be creative when, than it is to learn a new business from scratch. I mean, I, I was with CSC almost 25 years. It took me a good 10 years before I actually understood what business we were in. Yeah. That's that's very good example because there are a lot of, we have a couple of younger listeners who want to step into kind of this direction and this roles. It, it, it requires to understand the core business of, of the company you work in. If not, it's not going to work. Because it's also what I have learned. You, the other people are not seeing you as as equal if you haven't been working in the business. You're not credible. Exactly. You're not credible. And you'll make so many mistakes coming up with ideas that won't work. But when you understand the business, you'll recognize immediately what won't work. Yeah. And then you can bring things much quicker that you do know. So my recommendation is don't apply for the innovation job until you've been in the business at least, at least 10 years. Yeah. So that leads me to the question, do we need innovation departments or people focusing on innovation at all? Well, innovation is the CEO's agenda, <laughs> okay? But the CEO has got a lot of other things going on and most of, most, of, most of his or her attention is gonna be focused on running of the current business. So my answer would be an equivocal yes. All right, uh, that maybe, maybe. And then the question is, what's the design of the operating model? Mm -hmm. Because the design of the operating model of the Office of Innovation needs to align to the operating model of the company. Now, we needed to have a centralized function because the nature of the company was so decentralized that if we couldn't harness all of the innovation, and all the resources from all around the world, we wouldn't change anything. We were a highly decentralized structure. And part of the transformation was more centralization, more globalization, so that we could bring to our clients global capabilities, not local capabilities. So we took that structure. However, in the Office of Innovation, which was based in Washington, which was which is where I was based, there were only about five or six people that were based there. Everyone else was based all over the world. But on a reporting basis, an organizational structure basis, and on a financial basis, I had it centralized. So I had a corporate budget and I would be paying for those resources in Germany, in France, in England, in Australia, in Brazil. And I had a very rich local network, but the governance and the decision making on the allocation of resources was totally centralized. Yeah, clever setup. I would like to lead us to the business building. I mean, we touched already a couple of things. Of You, you mentioned that you're the chairman of Leo, where I would love to dig a little bit into. But before we go into this, you mentioned as well that you have invested into crypto and like you do so many things. How, how, how do you do that? And, and what, what, are, what are the drivers of investing into companies and as well like supporting smaller businesses like startups? Well, I like interesting ideas. 
I, I'm I'm really I'm I'm a really an individual who's fascinated by ideas. I'm not an operating executive per se. And when I when my son introduced me to Bitcoin, I found the idea very very compelling. I thought this was a really clever thing because it solved a big problem. It solved a number of big problems. And so I invested and and we found these people out in San Francisco who had developed a wallet. They had no money. They had a really good application. And we were the first investors in the company and then others followed and eventually were sold out. So it was all about the interesting idea of something that was personally relevant to me. What, how could I, how could I have an asset class that was uncorrelated and was a hedge against inflation that could, I could use totally globally that I didn't need to worry about, you know, I mean, bonds, stocks, you know, gold, precious metal assets, all those, all lots of options. I was already in those and I was looking for an asset class that I didn't really, I really wasn't investing in. So it was more about the ideas and um, I don't have a problem with my time. I mean, I don't feel like I'm overworked. I, I do, I do work a fair amount. Okay. But I'm not, I don't feel at all stressed because it's all interesting work for me. It's ideas that are fascinating. The work with Leo in particular is just a fascinating concept where we're trying to make successful. Yeah. Let's let's go into this. So Leo, for everyone who hasn't heard about it, it's it's called Leading Edge Only and it's the global innovation marketplace. Give us a little bit uh, a perspective of the beginning of Leo. How did how did it happen? How did you did, did you find each other and how did you decide to start the business? OK, so Scott Sharp, who is the CEO and founder of the company, um, was the CEO of a, of a software company based in the UK that sold licenses for software that enabled you to evaluate the uh, suitability of the employees you had as to whether or not they were actually qualified to do the jobs you had given them. And I had a fairly big challenge because I was running the BA Systems outsourcing contract. I had 2,000 staff um, that I was responsible with and operating in Sweden, United States, United Kingdom, and France. And so I needed to have a way, uh, a method to identify whether or not we had the right people in the right roles. And Scott had the software and we brought him in and we had a very successful program, which helped us a lot to get to, to step up the quality of delivery on the overall program. And then I went back to the States. And then as I got close to retirement, Scott and I just stayed in touch. And I said, Scott, I'm retiring in October. And he said, well, look, I've got this business here. And he told me what it was. And I said, he said, would you mind joining and be participating in it? So we had some conversations and I found it fascinating because it, it, what I was able to bring was the perspective of what the large corporate needs. Hmm. And he was able to bring the perspective of what the small medium enterprise bring, brings because he was selling his services as an SME into the large corporates. And I was running the innovation program for a very large corporate. So there was a synergy there. So we put our heads together. And in November of 2013, um, I teamed up with him and I've been in business with him ever since. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Can you, can you give a little bit more details on what, what the benefit of using uh, Leo is for, if we talk about corporate specifically? Well, let, let's talk about the model and the strategy, which is that large co corporates have um, the following problem. One, all of the resources to do innovation are rarely exclusively within the corporation. So they need to look outside the corporation for innovative ideas and solutions. The question is, how do you do that? And that's a cognitive problem that has two key issues. One is, how do you find out about all the things that are available outside the company and then how do you find out about them in a way that's relevant to what you're trying to solve as a problem? Because if you started just putting into a Google search engine, you know, your questions, you'd get back thousands of responses, but there's no filtering on it. So the problem we're trying to solve for the large corporate is to reduce the cost and reduce the risk of getting the maximum access to what is going on outside the company and to present that information in a relevant format. That's the problem we're trying to solve. Hmm. For the SME, 
the problem we're, sol we're solving is how does the SME get their product positioned to the large corporate? And then the final leg of the stool is the universities. The universities are a font of innovation and creativity and solutions, but they're very poor at marketing themselves. And unless you're a, a Stanford or a Harvard or an Oxford or Imperial, where you've got everyone wants to come to and talk to you, there's, there's a lot of universities out there where there's a lot of innovation going on and how do they get themselves known? So we've designed the, we've designed the platform to give a person access to all of the leading universities in the world with one stop, one click of the URL. And then they can sort which innovations they're looking for from which in universities and we connect them to it. We do the same thing with the SMEs and we do it and, and then the corporate. So we're creating a, um, an agora, if you will, a digital agora where the parties can come together and discover innovations that they wouldn't have otherwise seen. And then the universities can then position their portfolio to the corporates. SMEs can do the same. And then the corporates can create their own library of solutions and, and, and the application that we develop curates that so it remains current and keeps them up to date. So that's the problem we're solving. Reduction of search cost and reduction of risk for the large corporate, increased act access and visibility for the enterprise and the universities, and increased uh, visibility for the SMEs who are trying to sell their products. Yeah. What, what I like on top of that is the, the functionality of challenges where a corporate can build kind of, hey, we have this challenge and we don't know how to solve it. Who can help us to figure that out? Yeah, that's a great that's a great point, Jens, because our philosophy is what I call supply-driven innovation. Yeah. Or excuse me, excuse me, demand-driven innovation. People don't care about innovation. They only care about solving problems. And the only reason they care about innovation is because the traditional methods for solving problems have been inadequate. They've been insufficient. And they're looking for that additional creativity or that diff additional aspect of a solution that gives them the edge they're looking for. So that's why we start with the challenge. A corporation says, I've got this particular problem I want to solve. Who can help? And so we create this system where we've had very good success with the corporates in terms of identifying stuff they never thought they'd be able to see. And that's why we have a, a very, very successful portfolio of clients that have stayed with us for quite a period of time. And the universities find it gratifying because they're getting their intellectual property used and the SMEs are getting their solutions there. So it's a win-win for all the parties. And we just want to be the market maker of that. Yeah. What I, I like very much putting now on my, my old uh, corporate head is the the possibility of putting the challenge as one aspect but as well basically the filtering aspect that you it's it's not everyone getting through to you it's there's a fil filtering al algorithm which gives you the possibility to take out the ones that are not relevant to you and so on because yeah no, if, that's if, important so we do we do the filtering on both ends yeah we do it on the end of the corporate which says you know, we have a menu that you, you select what your criteria are that you're looking for, which helps to qualify. So if you if you don't want to do business with companies that don't have, for example, private equity behind them, you just click that and nothing will yeah. show up if you do it. So we filter by your own preferences. And then on the other end, with the suppliers, they also filter with where they think their solution is going to map. And then the two are brought together through the software and the algorithm says, hey, if you're looking for a company that is is private equity based working in the utility industry for solutions around improving the security of the network this company's got something interesting and that's exactly what we try to do yeah and 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 i'm highlighting this because i know there are people out there who are just trying to do that on linkedin they're just posting hey we have this challenge who is willing to help but you know how this works in this world everyone is reaching out to you worst case and it's not there's no vetting there's no real filtering where it's like hey they can truly support that and then you spend a lot of time and a lot of cost in finding out who is the right partner yeah and the linkedin network isn't isn't set up for this the linkedin network exactly. is all about the professionals yeah. it's about people's careers it's about interesting work that's being done and yeah corporates position themselves there but this is a very specialized integration 
that requires complete focus and dedication on solving this particular problem. It's really hard to do. <laughs> I mean, yeah. we've been working at it now nine years and we're still discovering how to do this well. But if you think of how do you get access to everything that need that that is relevant to what you do, but have it presented to you in a way that's that's relevant so you don't have to be sort, sorting through all sorts of stuff that's extraneous to that, that is a big problem. That is not easily solved. And you're not going to do it as a byline. You're not going to do it as well. It would really be nice if we could do that. No, we have to be totally dedicated in that, and that's all we do. We don't take a cut on any of the innovations. We let that go to the parties. We're just there to make the market. Yeah. And that's – And how do you see this growing going forward? I mean, you, you're you in from, from the beginning, um, and it has grown already tremendously. Yeah. Be, I just see it's a huge opportunity for, I mean, I come from large corporate and as well, everyone basically I work with, the bigger companies for sure, because they just need to integrate this way of thinking into their processes. And we, we talked about the corporates before. It's basically like like you said, is what process is working, what is not, not working. If you have a problem like every company has, how do you find someone who can help you to get there quicker? And solve the problem quicker because you in the end you can't solve everything yourself well the good news is that the idea of an open innovation system is fairly well accepted mm. across all the corporates it's not like yeah. i have to convince them that the, there's a very high probability that the solution they're looking for is not inside their company otherwise it would already have been deployed exactly <laughs> so the chances of them finding it inside the company i think I don't know what the percentage is, but it's very high of corporates are looking outside. And some of the real pioneers would be people like Laffley at P&G, who really pioneered the concept of open innovation and creating the portals. But now everyone does it. It's, it's now a very open concept. So we don't have that challenge to cover. The problem is in the implementation, is in the execution, yeah. is in the delivery. It's not in the conceptualization of the problem anymore. I agree. So it's it's not just the matchmaking and getting to know each other. It's taking the relationship, if we call it relationship, to the next level and then looking into how do we secure the long-term integration of, let's say, if, if a startup is applying to solve that problem, of the startup solution inside of the corporate that the, let's say, like we talked about, the internal immune system is not fighting against it. So you need to bring the right stakeholders on board You need to be able to to translate it to them that they understand it and then make it happen so that successful seen from the business as well. Yeah, and there's another aspect of this, which is in addition to the criteria of what you're looking for, you also have the timing. And timing is very difficult to predict. But let's say someone puts out a challenge and gets 30 responses, which is not uncommon when, when we do this but only two or three are relevant today. What do you do about all the rest of them? Well, we've developed the software to create a library for you that then has automatic links to the SMEs as part of the library so that it gets updated. And, and, and they may not be relevant today, but they could be relevant tomorrow, or they could be relevant tomorrow because they've done something differently than what they did today. So it's a dynamic process. It's not like a one-shot effort. You're constantly, you've got a portfolio of companies that you're aligned with strategically because the filtering system has brought you together. But the synchronization is a very active management style that the CIO or anyone else who's responsible for that needs to take accountability. All we provide is the software functionality, the systems, the network, the infrastructure, so they don't have to develop that on their own. Yeah. How do you, how do you see the importance of relationships in general? if we take the matchmaking and then building relationships between the different entities? Well, increasingly that's become more important to us than it was before. Originally, we didn't really factor that into the equation, but it's clear that making the connection and building relationships um, is a really important factor in, in, in the dissemination of it. The problem we've had is with COVID for the last couple of years, it's difficult for people to meet in person. Yeah. But ultimately, we think 
that what we've created with this digital agora will instantiate itself in physical events at some point and that we'll have we'll, we'll do what we do in the cloud we'll do in person at the right time in the right place in the evolution of the company right now we're right now we're doubling every year so we've got a good growth rate on that basis i think that's healthy i don't actually want to grow any faster yeah because if you try to grow too grow too fast you you run into all sorts of problems but doubling is a nice healthy pace and enables you to learn and change and modify and adjust and we're always doing that i mean we have you know we have our board meetings almost every week on fridays is when we get together mm -hmm. and we're constantly thinking about what could we be doing different and so we we're we're very much in in the discovery mode and the innovative mode ourselves we're not scaling right now we're just building the portfolio building the solution the, the system is really quite incredible now after nine years of development. And it's very hard for someone to replicate all that functionality and all that knowledge that we put in there over that period of time. So we feel we feel pretty, pretty positive about the overall business. Yeah. And I, I, I just see with with my background, the huge potential. It's so tremendously huge. I mean, there are a couple of big, big clients you have already. But I think there are a couple of big clients still missing who would would tremendously benefit from it. Yeah, and I think that's it, it's just a matter of time for me. Well, we agree, and we think it's it's uh, we would like to see a world in which all corporates are subscribing to Leo as just a way of doing business. If mm -hmm. you're going to be looking at innovation, if you're going to be managing your portfolio, you know, there's no point in trying to do it inside with your own systems and stuff. It's got to be a global network that you're connected to so we're just creating the network and all of those entities become nodes in the network and become part of the system maybe that's that's a good point we haven't touched that too much it's global oh yeah so it's it's not one market only and i think that's very important for large organizations as well that there is a global outreach and a global perspective not just hey it's a uk-based company yes but it's not for the uk market Oh, no. oh yeah, no. We have clients all over the world, and yeah. I'll give you. I'll give you. We, we were very chuffed when this came about, which is we won business with a very large company in Perth, Australia, and and we were kind of curious as to why or how they found out about us. So we talked to them, and they said, "Well, how did you find out?" And and the answer was, "Oh, Harvard Re Harvard University recommended uh, you to us." It's not too uh, bad. That, that made our day. Okay. When you have Harvard <laughs> recommending us to a client in Perth, Australia, you are you are really global. And this is happening all the time. We're getting we, we have so many companies in the pipeline that we're talking to now who want to become part of the system that you know, and that we set our objectives, just double the growth every year, double the number yeah. of clients, double the revenue, and growing on that basis. Because we're patient investors, we're not traders, we're really building a company. Yeah, and that's like you said, true innovation takes time and then it it, it goes really well. In yeah, the I corporate think, I think anyone who's getting into starting a small business, if you have a perspective of anything less than 10 years, you're not being realistic. Yeah. It takes a long time to build a business, a successful business. You should have told me earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it's also good to fail. <laughs> oh, I failed. I failed many times. The failures were as important as the successes. I agree. Let, let's get into the last part of the podcast where I'm asking a couple of questions that are less related to the context we have spoken about okay. until now. So if you could work with a project, lead a project yourself that is impacting every human being on earth, what project would you choose to work with or work in and why? Wow, that's a question. I I have no idea. <laughs> I, I'm doing I'm doing now work that I think is interesting. And it's interesting because it's intellectually stimulating. It's interesting because I think it's doing good things in the world and I'm doing it because I can make money at it. So I kind of have to have all three of those things there. I want to do something that's creating positive energy in a particular area and i have a number of things that i'm doing on that basis but i also want to do stuff that keeps me intellectually stimulated and and keeps me current and alive to what's going on and then finally i want to make some money 
I mean, I, 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 you know, I want to base, basically take care of my family and, and have enough wealth to be able to do that. So those are the things that motivate me. I can't think of a specific thing that I'm not doing today that I would want to do, but that could change tomorrow. That's okay. So if, if you, if you talk to a young person, maybe a, a grandchild of you, of yours, what, what would you advise them if they would say, I want to work in innovation? I would, I would advise them to, first of all, learn skill sets and develop knowledge in areas that are practical, that people need. So develop domain expertise in particular areas and have a, have a mastery of that expertise, whatever it is, whether it be medicine or whether it be law, or whether it be business or whatever it is. You need to know something. <laughs> You need to have some practical knowledge that you can apply on that basis. So domain specific expertise is a prerequisite for anyone doing innovation. The other thing I would recommend is for them to read widely. The more you read, the more your aperture is open to understand and see opportunities on that basis. And um, one of my favorite things to do is to read. <laughs> to just constantly learn something new going on, even if it's not directly related to business. My particular affinity is history and historical fiction. That's what I like to spend most of my time reading uh, on that basis. And the third thing I would recommend is travel widely. You know, get, get out of the house, get out of the city, get out of the country, go out and see different things and different things, you know, the way different people do uh, that sort of stuff. I, I started traveling fairly early in my life and it changed everything on that basis. So learn, learn a skill or learn knowledge that's useful that you can really master, read widely and travel. I don't know what else you, you, you need to do. You, the chance of success if you do those three things is very, very high. Yeah, I agree. Lem, well, it's a pleasure having you on the podcast and I have learned a lot. I have two pages of notes. Thank you very much for well, being on the show. It was a pleasure. Well, Jens, I enjoyed it as well. And I learned some things as well. I, did, I didn't know, you know, you always, the best way to learn something is to teach it. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Super. Okay. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to today's episode. You will find the links and resources in the show notes of this episode. If you would like to support the podcast, the most impactful thing you can do is subscribing to the show on any of the podcasting platforms and give me a review. This will help me to reach more innovators around the world and bring some of you into the show. If you have any question to the guest or want to engage with me, feel free to reach out to me on social media and contact me there.